Um, it's good to be together tonight. Uh, I hope some of you get the day off tomorrow and actually take the day off tomorrow. Um, I always, our, half of my family lives in the UK and they have so many what they call bank holidays, which means everything closes down. Um, like it's an unreasonable amount of time off. And then I always laugh. We kind of have like two bank holidays a year and it's like, well, I might take it, might not. Um, so take tomorrow if you can rest, enjoy. I've heard the sun's coming back out. Um, not in a summer way, but in like a normal kind of, I don't know, something kind of a way. So anyways, um, if you were here last week, you know that we are doing a series on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, last week was week one. We focused on, any, any takers? Yes, our Father who art in heaven. Someone was listening. <laughs> um, and so before we kind of dive in, let's read it from the top together, and then we'll unpack this week. So if you have your Bibles, it's Matthew 5. We're picking up in verse 6. Matthew 6, sorry. Matthew 5. And we're picking up in verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yeah, it's good. (laughs) I didn't write it, but it's really good. Um, (laughs) I'm Dana, by the way. Um, I'm part of this church, and I'm really excited to be sharing the word this evening. Um, If you missed last week, I definitely encourage listening to the podcast, but really it was a week about orientation, our orientation towards God, towards who he is, um, towards the character and the way that he chooses to present himself to us. Think about what we know of God in the Old Testament, God um, God of our father, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet Jesus begins this prayer, not with a God of our fathers, but a God who is our father, a God who is present, a God who is familial, a God who is intimate to each and every prayer. And then he says, who is in heaven, a God who is also in the cosmos, a God who is infinite, a God who somehow holds this tension of creating the universe and yet dwelling in the earth because that is where his children live. Um, And Jesus sets up the prayer in this powerful, beautiful way um, that really creates, I think, a, a posture, if you will, Um, of how we approach prayer, um, how we come into this place. Because if our orientation towards God is mistaken or misappropriated, so much of our prayer life will be misaligned or misdirected or missing altogether. Which is why, interestingly, in the Lord's Prayer, God's depiction, the opening phrases, is directly followed by this request, hallowed be your name. Now this week we begin the petition portion of the prayer. So there are six listed requests that Jesus tells us to pray. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Now, we begin with the first, and arguably, I would say, not just because I'm teaching on it, I'm teaching on a couple others, but I'd say this is the most important of all six requests. The very structure of the prayer itself is that the last five, that which is to follow, serve this single petition. Nothing is more clear and unshakable, one scholar I was reading commented, then that the purpose of the entire universe is for this thing, the hallowing of God's name. His kingdom comes for that. His will be done for that. Humans have bread sustaining life for that thing. We, our sins are forgiven for that. Temptation is escaped for that. All so that his name might be made holy. 
Now, for years, I don't know about you, but I, I, I looked at this phrase, and in a way, I almost, not dismissed it, but I think I assumed that it was um, a declaration, right? So God is holy. It's a declaration of his character. It's a declaration of who he is, kind of. Um, and in studying this and kind of diving into um, really scholarly thought and understanding of the, of the passage itself, what has really struck me, and maybe this is common knowledge to everyone, but it's not a declaration at all. This is first and primarily, the, 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 um, this is first the primary request that Jesus asks us or instructs us to pray, hallowed be your name. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time this evening exploring why this understanding is so necessary and then subsequently how that changes the practice of prayer itself. Does that make sense? Does that sound good? Yep. All right, I'm glad you didn't say no. I have no other sermon prepped. So um, is it popping? Oh, I almost feel like I don't need it, but. All right, so let's take a few moments to unpackage the word, unpackage the phrases. The nice thing about doing the Lord's Prayer line by line is that we really get to spend some time with it. Um, Jesus summed up how we should pray in like five verses, um, which means there's a lot in those five verses. So hallowed is a curious word, right? The word hallow. We don't use it really at all. The only reference I could think of is Harry Potter. I love Harry Potter, um, so that makes it very important. Apparently, no one else does, um, so that's fine. Thank you. I expected, like, some chanting or something. Uh, But that's the only modern-day reference, right, that you can think of to the word hallowed or hallow. The Deathly Hallows, it's one of the books. Anyways, um, go and read it tomorrow, okay? (laughs) Did you all grow up in the area that people thought wizards were bad? Yeah, they're not, okay? They're awesome. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, all right. Yet what's interesting to me is despite the fact that this term is quite archaic, even the newest translation of the NIV includes it, right? So they contemporize a lot of other things, but this term, hallowed, they kind of hold on to. And as we explore it, I think it becomes pretty self-evident why there is almost no other word in the English language that does what this word does. So simply put, hallow means to make something holy, to sanctify it, or to set it apart. And I think where my misunderstanding for years came was that I always perceived it as a declaration or an adjective about God. So in the same way that our Father, who is in heaven, holy is his name, right, was seen to me as a description of who God is. Is, but that's not actually what's being said. Yes, God is holy, don't worry. But what Jesus is getting at here is a verb. It connotates an active word about God. Now, to help us understand this, because I am not a Greek scholar, and so I'm not about to pronounce these words, but I think, do we have that picture? Okay, so this is a Greek translation, the top word being the Greek ones. Once again, not going to pronounce them. No. Um, <laughs> not even going to attempt. But I want you to look at the, the translations on the, bottom, on the bottom two phrases. This is how that word translates. Let be being holyized. Let it be being hallowed. See what I'm saying here? What the translators are up against is this progressive aspect or nature of the Greek word that's being used there. So the name of the Father in heaven, let that name be being made holyized, let it be being made hallowed. Okay? You can take that away now. Um, so, So essentially what Jesus is getting at here, let his name be being sanctified, be being holy or set apart. And when we pray this phrase, hallowed be your name, we are praying for an active thing to take place, which begs the question for us tonight, what does it mean for you and I personally when we say, God, may your name be holyized, (laughs) may your name be hallowed in our midst? 
Now, we know from scripture, did I get lose some of you there? Are you still with me? Okay. I lost you. Okay, that's officially. <laughs> my brother is with me, good, always, and my husband, perfect. The rest of you, you can leave. I'll teach the rest of the message to them. Um, I know it's complicated, but I think it is so revolutionary, okay? What we know from scripture is that God's name, it, it represents both his reputation, but it also represents his person. That's why in the ancient Jewish context, they wouldn't even say the name of God because it was such a holy and a profound thing. And by phrasing it like this, Jesus is calling for us to begin prayer, to begin petition, not with our temporary daily needs, which is how we normally begin if we're honest. Rather, he is calling us to say, hallowed be your name. We are asking God in that moment to let his name, who he is, his person, person, we are asking that that thing be true in us. That what is true about God in the cosmos would be made known in my life. God is sacred. God is holy. God is set apart. But my prayer each and every day is that his holy and sacred name would be true, not just in theology, not just in ideology, but in the practice of my very life. And so the response of my heart in prayer above all else should hold to honoring, esteeming, admiring, valuing, treasuring, worshiping, adoring God's name above all other things. And the reason this moment, this petition is so important and so distinct is that none of the other five requests deal with the heart in the way that this one does. You see, this moment, this prayer is about what really matters to us, what is primary. Because it's very easy in our daily lives to allow other things to be hallowed, to allow other things to be holy, to be set apart, to be the thing that we want more than anything else. But prayer, prayer is the moment where first and foremost we say, God, let you above all else, you are above all else, But I want that revelation, that reality to permeate the very depth of my soul. And I think Jesus does this because it sets the stage and adjusts our understanding of what prayer really is. You see, prayer is first and foremost about the reality of God. It's not primarily where we ask for things, give us today our daily bread. It's not primarily where we confess the things we've done, forgive us our sins. It is first and foremost about the sacred name of God being made holy. First and foremost, prayer, hear me, prayer is about adoration. That is what Jesus is calling us into. Look at how Jesus begins this conversation. So go back a couple verses if you're still open to Matthew 6. And this is picking up in verse 5. Jesus says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not go on like, uh, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. You see, the hypocrites in this story by Jesus, have made prayer about the approval of man. It's about their own reputation. It's about their standing, their righteousness, their religiosity. This is the thing that we should do, and I want everyone to know that I'm doing it. And it's so easy, as we normally do when Jesus talks about Pharisees, to skip over it. 
um, because we disassociate ourselves from the religious um, kind of piety of the day. And yet, as I was thinking about this, I thought about how many of us only ever pray in a church context. So when we're gathered together like this or when we're in a community group, And it got me thinking about the reality, can I be humble enough to reconsider that I am possibly guilty of hypocrisy when it comes to my practice of prayer because I only ever do it in the public places? So maybe this is Jesus challenging me about what I think prayer is. And then we have the Gentiles or the pagans who have made prayer all about getting the things that they need from the gods. It's about their well-being, their finances, their family, whatever it is. And once again, it's easy to dismiss, but I know that I'm guilty of only coming to God in prayer when I need something. When things are going bad or my job is rough or I'm struggling in my marriage or in a relationship and I come to him and although I'm not saying it as such, what I'm really trying to do is convince God to change my circumstances in one way or another. And once again, I have to be humble enough to go, Jesus, maybe I'm guilty of that too. Maybe I'm guilty of both. But you, Jesus instructs, you are to make prayer about the Father not about anything else, not about others, not even about yourself, but about the Father. Do it in secret and let him be made holy. Let him be sacred. Let him be set apart. Let him be praised. And friends, if this is the practice of our prayer, if this is the thing that we choose to engage with, if the hallowing of God's name is primary in our lives, then it changes not only the way we pray, it changes everything else we do. It changes the very way in which we operate. This revelation and practice should reframe every aspect of our lives. Remember that moment in the Old Testament where um, the people of Israel are traveling through the desert, right? And they, they are so upset all the time about one thing or another. And in this instance, they're really upset because they seem to have run out of water. And so they are grumbling to Moses. It's one of the many moments where they say, we should have stayed in Egypt. It was better there. We had the Nile River. Um, And so Moses then goes to God and is like, you know, very, what do I do with these people? So frustrated. And God says to him, I want you to speak to the rock and water will flow out. But Moses is frustrated and angry. And so he calls all the people together and he strikes the rock twice. You remember that moment? It's in um, Numbers 20. And God says this to Moses. He says, because you did not trust in me enough, or honor me as holy because you did not hallow me in the eyes of the people of Israel, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given you. You see why this request matters, hallowed be your name, because the posture of my heart has ramifications on the way that I live. When I hallow the name of God, My belief is aligned with the reality of who he is. John says, when we don't believe God, we make him a liar. Is God a liar? No, obviously. But when I don't believe that God is who he says he is, when I don't act in accordance with the reality that he is holy, that he is faithful, that he is loving, that he is kind, that he is generous, that he is merciful, that he is always with me in the highlands or the heartache, when I don't act like that, his name is not being made hallowed in my, in my life, in my choices, and in my actions. And we can find ourselves, like Moses, acting not out of trust, acting not out of belief, acting not out of the revelation that God is who he says he is, but acting out of an alternate alternative reality. Does that make sense? Another example um, also with the people of Israel is they are um, in, they're in exile and God speaks through Ezekiel and he says this about himself. He says, I will sanctify my great name which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in your midst. But then the nations will know that I am the Lord when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. 
That's Ezekiel 36. Or as Isaiah puts it, he says this, they will sanctify his name indeed. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and they will stand in awe of the God of Israel. In other words, God is saying his name will be made hallowed, will be made holy when he does what? When he redeems his people. Why? Because suddenly who God is, is being played out in the reality of the lives of those he has chosen. Does that make sense? When he does what he promised, when we allow him the space to act in accordance with his character, his name is made holy. His name is made sacred because God is doing what he said he would do. The messianic redemption of God is him making his name holy in the way he always intended to. And for you and I, friends, it looks like this. When God's name is being made hallowed, we believe his promises. We truly live out of the reality of who he is. His character is suddenly on display in our lives. We make choices not in accordance with the things we want. We make choices according to his will, according to what we know about God to be true. When his name is being made hallowed in my life, his, his, his will is made manifest in me, and so I can trust him. I live in peace. I don't live in fear. There's a beautiful moment. um, I think it's in Isaiah where he says, the Lord says, do not fear what they fear, but let my name be holy. What is God saying? When my name is holy, when you know me for who I am, all the things that man fears, you won't fear those things. You won't live in that reality because you will live in the reality of who I am. And that is a secure reality. That is a constant reality. That is a true reality. That reality does not change. This reality is chaos. This reality is destruction. This reality is fear and anxiety and and the the need to please and the pressure and, and, and the worries of this world. But the reality of God being made holy is a reality of peace and mercy and grace and his goodness being poured out every day This reality is a God who knows what we need before we even ask. Friends, if we pray nothing else, let it be this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus, let your name be holy in me. You see, if God alone is holy to us, if he alone is sacred, if he is the one thing that we truly care about, that we want our lives to be given to, if he is the truth that I believe, if he is the thing that I cling to above all else, then by necessity, everything else bows to him. Everything else pales in comparison to the reality of a God who is holy. All other requests, all other needs, all other fears, all other emotions bow to him bow to him. On the drive here tonight, um, it was Radio radio Lab, and they were um, talking about uh, professional athletes. And there was a study done by a psychologist over 10 years where he asked groups of athletes over and over and over again, if I could give you a pill that would ensure you get a gold medal at the next Olympics, but you would die five years after you got the gold medal, would you take it? And he said every single time they did the study, over 50% said yes. You know what's holy in their lives? Something destructive. Even from a non-Christian perspective, the, the, the other athletes and psychologists on the show were talking about basically the pressure of perfection and how people are literally willing to die. They would give their lives up just for that one gold medal. And it wasn't a part of my sermon, but I thought it exemplified so perfect when other things become the sacred thing, when other things become holy. And that's an extreme example, but we do it in subtle ways all the time. And Jesus instructs us to pray this first because he knows each and every day we need to get before him and we we need to say, God, 
I want you to be the only thing that is hallowed and sacred in my life. I don't want to serve something else. I don't want to give my life to something else. I don't want to be pulled away. I think of that old hymn, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That is how we are prone. And this prayer brings us back. This prayer brings us back to who God is, the secure foundation. So how does this guide our practice of prayer? Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the end of this series and know more about prayer, but have done it less, does that make sense, or just the same? I want to recognize the ways in which I have acted hypocritically about prayer, I want to recognize the ways in which I'm guilty of, I think the phrase in pre-service prayer was treating God like a genie or a vending machine, where I only go when I need something. I want to create a practice of prayer in my own life that looks really different like this. And I'm being honest, this is not a... Um, a few years ago, we did like a spirit, oh, last year we did like a spiritual disciplines book and prayer, man, it is my challenge. It is the thing I wrestle with. I find it hard to focus in. Martin Luther is famous for saying, right, the busier the day, the longer he'd spend in prayer. I think the phrase was, I have a busy day. I better spend three hours in prayer. And I'm like, whoa, I'm not there yet. Um, but I, I want to get to the end of the series and, and I want to be in a posture where I am engaging with God in prayer. And I think this is what sets us up because personally I'm not inclined that way, but I actually think culturally we're not inclined to engage like this. I don't think prayer is a strength. Um, And in past generations, I think there was far more of an emphasis, right, on prayer. I was at a women's retreat a few months ago and it was a predominantly older um, church. So women in their 50s, 60s, well, 60s, 70s and 80s really. And we were sitting around this table and chatting with these amazing women. And I think I shared this with some of you, but there was this one woman there and we were talking about prayer. And she said that she had a prayer partner and for 35 years, 35 years, they prayed together every week for an hour, every week for 35 years. She's like, if one of us was on vacation, we would call in and they would spend an hour a week, which sounds crazy and yet it's not hour a week in prayer, and I found myself struck again by the reality that I don't really know how to engage like that. I don't really know what that kind of discipline looks like. Because if our primary focus of prayer, which I have been guilty of, is about temporary needs or wants, or equally if it's about confession, so you find yourself going to God when, you, when you've sinned or you want to kind of clear that, resisting temptation, God, I'm struggling with this, won't you help me? If, if we only find ourselves praying for those things, when those things are under attack, then what we have to understand is then those are the things that are holy and sacred because those are the things that take us to prayer. If the thing that I adore is my family or my job or security or my relationship, then I will only feel the need to pray when that is in jeopardy. However, if every single day of my life I wake up and my objective is the hallowedness of God's name in my life, if he is the thing that I adore, then before petitions, before confession, comes sheer adoration, just enjoying him. And I think we've misunderstood this aspect of prayer. We've made it about a list. We've made it about a duty. We've made it about the thing that we have to do because it's a church, but we haven't made it about Jesus. We haven't made it about our father. So I wanna challenge us this week. I'm going to wrap up. You know, when I thought about the, um, that woman praying for 35 years, I thought there are two things that kind of make the difference, right, in that situation. The first is accountability, someone you pray with. The second is, is the reality of who God is. Because over 35 years, you can bet there were good seasons and there were bad and I'm, if it was only dependent on the bad, then prayer would have happened every couple of weeks when things got rough. 
But if prayer was based on the reality of God, then no matter where those two women found themselves, they found themselves in prayer because they knew what it was really about. And so I want to challenge us this week to those two things, accountability and the reality of who God is. Every single day, at least once, maybe you set aside your drive to and from work or your lunch break or 20 minutes in the morning or when you're in the shower, but I want you to take a moment and I want you to ask your heavenly father that his name would be made hallowed in your life. And for the next week, I want us to set aside our needs and our wants and all the other things that crowd our prayer life or the things we feel like we have to do, the checklist we have to go through. And I want each and every one of us to set aside time that isn't on a Sunday or a Thursday or a Wednesday. And I'll ask us to take our hearts and our minds and our souls and our bodies and go, God, won't you be, won't you be made holy in this? In everything that I say, in everything that I do, in the thoughts of my mind, in the reactions of my heart, Won't you be made holy? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be made, uh, hallowed be your name. Father, won't you be made holy in my work, in my marriage, in my family, in my friends, in my time, in my solitude. Let every waking moment of my life display that I believe you are who you said you are that I believe you know and you see and you understand that before I speak a word, you are aware of exactly what I need. I am gonna focus on the reality of who you are and allow that to form my trust and my mind. Because Father, above all else, I want my desires to desire you. Above all else, I want my will to be conformed to yours. Above all else, I want you to be the most sacred thing in my life. Now, I know this is going to be slightly uncomfortable, but we are going to practice something of this right now. My brother told me that um, millennials don't like being told what to do, so I am not going to tell you what to do. I am going to invite you into doing the thing that I will make sure that you do. Um, So this is what I want us to do. Before we leave tonight, we're going to go into a time of worship and end in adoration. But either the person next to you, if it's a spouse, if it's a friend, if you feel totally awkward, you really don't have to. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to name the time of day that you are going to do this. Okay? And they're not going to check up on you, but I think there's power in going, okay, I'm going to decide my drive to work every day. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray those words. Um, And then what I would like us to do is take a couple minutes, minute or two, nothing more, and I just want you to pray about who God is. I just want you to take a moment to be enraptured in his holiness. I think one of the scholars I was reading, I forget who it was, but they said, um, prayer gives us relief from the melancholic burden of self-absorption self-absorption. How often is our prayers really just about the self? This week, we're going to learn the discipline of Jesus making it about you. So do that with the person next to you. Think about it and just go, I'm going to set aside these five minutes when I wake up at night, whatever it is, say it out loud. And if nothing else, you have decided that that's the way you're going to practice it. Is that okay? All right. It's it's an invitation. Okay. So do it. (laughs)